Welcome. My name is Pastor Samuel Biebert here at Christ Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Minnesota. Thank you so much for joining me today for uh, a little devotion. It's been a couple of days uh, since we had one of these. We uh, had a, a funeral in the family and took a little time to go and, and be there for that. Uh, it was a little bit different with the social distancing regulations and everything and having to have smaller crowds, but um, still thankful for the opportunity to, to be there with family. We have been, or we started, looking at plagues. Uh, if you might have to go back a couple of days, I believe it was on, on Friday, um, or maybe even Thursday, I think it was Thursday, we had our, our last uh, devotion. But the, ne the next plagues, or I should say plagues, I wanted to look at was in Egypt. And, and the plagues in Egypt start in chapter 8 in Exodus. And it's really interesting to note these plagues and how um, these plagues are viewed, especially by unbelievers. We don't hear too terribly much about how believers, um, the, the Israelites, specifically viewed these plagues from God. Um, the focus isn't as much on them. We'll, we'll look at that more in a few other places as we continue this look. But it's really interesting to see this and to see why God allowed these specific plagues. In general, God allowed these plagues to show the Pharaoh that he was to listen um, to, to God and, and to let the people go um, to let them go and, and to worship God. But Pharaoh was pretty insistent on saying no. He thought he was in control. He thought that, you know, the, the things that he was doing was more important. And ultimately, he was focused on growing his kingdom and maintaining control of his people. Um, and God was showing him that he just simply was not in control. And that's what we see in many of these plagues, and, and we see the different aspects of, of that um, showing itself in different ways. But I wanted to look at the first three, and we'll kind of take these in groups just because we could spend a lot of time on, on each of them individually. But looking at the first three and kind of grouping them up, and these first three plagues, the plague of um, blood, plague of frogs, and then also the plague of the gnats, um, they were plagues that affected everybody. It was not as if it just was held to a, a, a small group of people or just the Egyptians, but these affected the Egyptians, the Israelites, everyone. And it's interesting to see the unbelieving, so to speak, view of these things. With the, the first plague, there was almost... Um, like, like, Pharaoh didn't care. Um, his magicians could duplicate this plague, and, you know, he didn't really see it as, as a great thing. And so this plague of blood, as terrible as it was, and it destroyed their water and, and crops because they, they couldn't, you know, irrigate properly and things like this, it, it was a devastating plague. But ultimately, it was just kind of, well, it's not that big of a deal. And they pressed on. And then there, there was the plague of frogs, and... This one brought some, I guess, remorse, you could say, to Pharaoh's heart, where um, he, they pleaded to take this away. The land reeked of them. And while Pharaoh wanted the, all these things to go away, the moment that there was relief, the moment that Moses said, okay, the, the plague is going to go away, Pharaoh hardens his heart once more and, and goes right back to life as normal. And then with the last plague, the plague of the gnats, it's interesting to see that um, the magicians that Pharaoh had, they, they couldn't duplicate this plague. They couldn't um, do the same thing that, that God allowed to happen with this plague. And I want to focus on just the last little verse, verse 19 of, of chapter 8 in Exodus. The magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen just as the Lord said. I think those three plagues kind of summarize the different views that people can have. 
when times of trouble come, when, when we have these things that are obviously bigger than us as people. Maybe the first is, oh, it's not that big deal. Sickness happens every day. This is nothing new. Maybe then, um, to others, there's kind of this remorse and the, maybe even a, a turning to God and admitting that, that God is around and that he is in control. But then as soon as relief starts coming, we can so quickly and so easily go back to the old way of life, to the old way of doing things and maybe to just simply even ignoring God. And then, just like with the, the third plague, the plague of gnats, there can also be that viewpoint where it just simply brings people to see, um, if not necessarily lead them to a change of, of heart or a direction in life or kind of a wake-up call, this is the finger of God. This is truly uh, proof that, that God is in control and that we are not. And as we look at these three different um, viewpoints, it is so important to keep in mind um, the opportunities that we can have even through hardship and even the blessings that God can um, bring to us even through hardship. You know, the Israelites, they dealt with all these things the exact same way as everyone else. And yet, God was working something wonderful through it all. Um, not just freedom from the oppression in Egypt, but ultimately if we keep the big picture in mind, they were led to the promised land where the promised Savior would be born, where Jesus would live his life for you and for me, where he would go to the cross to pay for your, your sins and mine, where he would rise victorious from the empty tomb and where victory over sin, death, and hell would be ours. That through this event that seems like it was so many years ago, so disconnected from us, God is working something wonderful that impacts us still today. And that's how amazing your God is. I cannot stand here today and say exactly what God is doing through this. The exact purpose that he has. He doesn't reveal that to us, but we can very, um, with great amount of confidence, say he's working something. He's, and we can trust him. And what he's working through it will be for the benefit of his people. It will be for the benefit of those who love him. It will be for the benefit of those who do not know him yet. And what an awesome encouragement that is. Um, encouragement to um, continue to reach out to those who need him so much, who need comfort, who need um, just that, that confidence that God's word gives. And may that be the focus of our prayer today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, it, it can be so easy to rely on ourselves and to um, really rely on the, the greatness of the minds that you have given us. Um, truly, marvelous tools and, and gifts. Um, but sometimes we can um, go so far as to think that we are greater, smarter, better than you. And when those times come or when those things happen, help us to simply um, be refocused onto the simple and beautiful fact that you are greater than us and that is such a blessing. That you are working something um, far better and, and have a, a far more wonderful plan in mind, and that is ultimately the salvation of your people. As we keep this all in mind, help us to simply live uh, lives of faith that trust you, that know you are in control, and that simply um, live through the difficulties that you allow with the opportunity to share that goodness that, of knowing you and of having the this true hope of salvation with others. We ask this all in Jesus' name, uh, knowing that you listen. Amen. Thank you so much again for joining me today, and may God richly bless the rest of your day.